Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me? A little bit. There it is. There it is. I didn't push the button more than I was supposed to, so that's a good start. We'll just, uh, just pray it keeps going that way. Um, I, I feel uh, just really um, privileged uh, to even be asked to be up here. Um, I, we've, my, my wife and I have been here for now almost three years, um, two and a half, and uh, we've just really, really loved uh, being with you guys. You guys are really wonderful. Uh, we consider you our family, and uh, it's been really great. Um, about a month and a half ago, Sean asked if I could preach on July 2nd, and my almost immediate thought was, was abiding, abiding in Christ. And so I, I sat on it for a couple weeks, and then come June 1st or 2nd, Bob preached on abiding uh, outside, if you, remember, if you were here for that, Bob preached, and I thought, man, who's listening on our conversations? <laughs> Bob, you're killing me. Um, actually, I, I hadn't even told them that I was going to talk about abiding, so I thought, well, maybe I should just take really good notes <laughs> and see how much you guys can remember from a month ago. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I should just preach on something else. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it's been done. Or, or maybe God is up to something. Maybe God has, has something in store for us as we think about abiding in June, as we think about abiding in July, as we think about abiding every day. So um, I just want to ask, um, as, we, as we read the scripture, um, a month ago, did God pique your interest about abiding? What was it that, that stuck with you a month ago? Or um, maybe there's something for you today. What is that? Let's, um, let's open our hearts this morning to the word of God and and uh, let's see what he might have for us. Um, I'm, so I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read John 15, um, just so you kind of know where we're going this morning. I'm going to ask you for synonyms, synonyms, <laughs> synonyms of abiding. So keep your eyes out as we read and think about that. I'm going to pray, and then I want to. I want to talk about the context of this story, where Jesus finds himself in his three years of ministry and the culmination of that. And we'll, we'll talk about abiding in, in Jesus' situation. So let's look at this together. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your words to us, your truth passed down, Lord, over thousands of years. And yet they're so relevant and so um, clear and um, heart piercing today. God, we, we are grateful 
for your Holy Spirit, and we ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts to whatever it is that you would have us here. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we read about abiding, um, I thought, sure, I could come up with a lot of synonyms for abiding, but you are smart, intelligent, thoughtful people, and you like to, you like to call out in church. I know it. I've heard it. <laughs> so when you hear abiding, what does abide mean? Are there, what, what do you think of? Resting. Resting, yeah. Remain. Remain, absolutely. Engaged. Engaged. Mm-hmm. Dwell. Dwell. Indwell, yes. Mm -hmm. Hanging out. out. I wrote that down. Hanging out. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Chilling. What's that? With. With. Yes. Connected? Absolutely. Yeah. Commune. Commune. That's good. That's good. One of the words that um, I've come to just be really attached to when I think of abiding is, is marinate. When I think of, um, it, it's, it's just amazing to me how you could take a kind of boring piece of meat, right? A meat, meat of your choice and soak it in, in the right spices, in the right juices. And just over for a couple hours, uh, you throw it on the grill and it could just taste amazing, Right? <laughs> Um, I also can't help but think of, of, when I say marinate, I can't help but think of uh, Guy Fieri, right? And diners, drive-ins, and dives. I feel like it's on TV every hour. You can't miss it. Um, and, and he goes to, to all of these different restaurants, and he goes to the cook, and he stands in the kitchen, and, and they all talk about the way that they make their special dishes. And almost, it seems like every time there are... There's some sort of marinating process in their special ingredients. They let it sit for four hours, for eight hours, for 24 hours. They let it uh, be in the fire cooking oven or whatever they do. I'm not a cook, so don't ask me. But they let it sit in there for a long time. It takes time for those, those things to really get into the meat and really make it taste just incredible. And sometimes, the longer it marinates, the better it tastes. There was a a meat market where we used to live down in Southern California, and it was the best thing to walk in and see this uh, spread of options for us. And there was always carne asada, right? Mmm, carne asada. That's, you know it's just been sitting in those, those like amazing Mexican juices and spices for hours. Hopefully not too long, right? <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't uh, longer than it should have been. But what, take, what makes it taste better than the amount of time that it's been sitting? This is the life that Jesus invites us to when he invites us to abide in him. Now, th- I'm going to have to say... Um, I think you could probably preach on this section of Scripture uh, for six months and not really exhaust all of the things that we can pull out of this. But but today, I just really want to focus on abiding and looking at how Jesus does that. Um, Jesus invites us to soak and marinate in our relationship with him. In him. Um, This also, you know, it's interesting to me when uh, a relationship starts to to come together. You see boy meets girl, girl meets boy, right? That happened with your your couple over the last year, right? They, um, what happens when you begin to get interested in someone? um, You spend some time together, right? You spend more and more time together. And then you spend all day together, and then you, you spend a significant amount of time with this person that you uh, became interested in. And I don't know if you've, if you've ever noticed that sometimes it just seems like they begin to rub off on each other, right? They begin to 
kind of talk the same and laugh the same and be all cutesy. Well, that's, that's, that's nice. That's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. And, and shouldn't it be the same way with us and Jesus? That the more that we spend time with each other, the more that, that I get to be with Jesus, that I should look like him, that I should talk like him, that might even laugh like him. He invites us into this closeness, this intimacy. But it's not just out of, out of nowhere. In this season of Jesus' life, he was under immense stress. He was probably, uh, I, I would imagine he might be perturbed on some level. Um, I want us to take a look at his humanness in this context so that we might learn from Jesus the ways that we can abide with him in the kind of situations that we go through. He is our image of the invisible God. He is our example, the one we look to for how we ought to live. We want to remain in him and navigate life as he navigated it. He didn't just say we ought to abide. He demonstrated how we ought to abide. Um, over and over and over again in the book of John, Jesus talks about, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I do what the Father tells me to do. And the reason Jesus was able to say that was because he was in relationship with the Father. I think that this setting... Speak to the vo speaks volumes in the ways that we can abide. How, when, and the way. So we're going to take a look at this. On Palm Sunday, we're going to kind of funnel our way there, starting with Palm Sunday, because Palm Sunday is pretty interesting. This is a week before he makes this statement about abiding to his disciples. One week. And he rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Well, on a donkey on Palm Sunday, right? <clears throat> and people are shouting, Hosanna, praise the Lord, right? At this time, uh, Luke 19 says, all the people hung on every word. All the people came early to the temple to hear him teach. People were enamored with Jesus. They were excited about who he was and what he was saying and what he was doing. So there was this buzz in the air about him. And also, Jesus performed many signs in their presence, but they still would not believe in him. It's interesting that there would be this excitement, this kind of um, uh, groundswell, if you, if you, if you will. Um, and, and yet, not everyone believed. They even saw his miraculous signs and still didn't believe. Underneath that, there was the religious elite, the, the leaders of the community who would say, we don't like Jesus at all. In fact, we need to get rid of him. But they were afraid. They were afraid because he had sway over the people. They tried to trap him at every turn. As you begin to look at all the stories after Palm Sunday, they would send leaders to try to trick him and trap him in what he would say and what he would do. They couldn't do it. Jesus didn't fit into their box of religiosity. Even some of the leaders, even they believed, but they wouldn't say anything. They were too afraid. They were afraid that they would lose their status. They cared more about their position in the community. In this season, the disciples were with Jesus, But they still didn't get it. And I, and I can only imagine how frustrating 
and hard that would be for him. They've spent three years with Jesus, walking all over Israel, right? Um, and they still didn't understand what was about to happen. Jesus tried to make it very clear. And they would still say, where are you going, Jesus? We want to go there too. Oh, you don't, disciples, you, don't, you can't go where I'm about to go. Peter, one of his three closest friends and followers, is making claims that he will follow Jesus to the end of, of to prison. He said, he'll, I'll follow you to prison. I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, you're making promises you can't keep. And I know that. Um, I believe it's Philip who says, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. It's John 14. And Jesus says, are you kidding me? It's been three years, and you still don't understand that when you see me, you've seen the Father? Three years, and you're saying to me, you're saying to me, Show us the Father and that will be enough. This hasn't been enough. The people um, had seen his miraculous signs. And who had seen more miraculous signs than the disciples? And they are still saying, show us the Father and that will be enough. And that would, that would, that would drive me crazy. I, that's why Jesus is Jesus. Also, in Luke 22, at the Last Supper... So they've, um, they've spent three years with Jesus. They, they watch him walk into, uh, into Jerusalem, people shouting Hosanna, him teaching in the temple. Amazing things are happening. And they've yet also had this very intimate relationship with him. They've gotten to see and hear and hear him explain things beyond what other people got to hear. And they began to question who was the greatest. Who was the greatest among the disciples? And Jesus is still correcting them. He's still saying, you're, you're totally missing the point. I came to serve, not be served. I came to set an example for you. So he takes off his outer cloak and he bends down and he washes their feet to demonstrate his love for them and to demonstrate for them what they ought to do for one another. That night, <clears throat> one of his 12, one of his closest would betray him. People praise him on Palm Sunday. Jesus knew that many of them didn't believe but the betrayal of Judas, now, he knew that this was going to happen. He knew that it needed to happen. But does that diminish the pain that he experienced when one of his followers, one of his own, for a, a, a small price, would betray him to the people who are trying to kill him? Disciples vanish. He knows that as he steps into the next day, that none of his disciples would come to his side. Peter denies that he even knows Jesus. Often people say one thing and mean another. And yet, Jesus said to them, abide in me. How do we abide when we experience that kind of pain? When the people close to us, when the people near to us say things that hurt us, that we might even say feels like betrayal. Jesus told the disciples to love each other as I have loved you. Now, I can't imagine how the disciples must, must have felt after Jesus was crucified and they realized that Judas was the one, one of their own, who betrayed Jesus. So I wonder if they stood in the room with the 11 of them 
and thought to themselves, I wonder if one of you would betray the rest of us. I mean, now Jesus is gone. Um, who's to say that, that Thomas won't rat us out? Who's to say that Philip won't stab us in the back? Peter, you denied Jesus. How are we supposed to love each other? Um, I, it, it is amazing. It is amazing to me that those disciples stuck it out for those three days while Jesus was um, in the grave. They had to come together in, the, in that moment. And Jesus made it very clear how we can abide with each other in those moments. You love each other. Abide with him. Love each other. That's what he says. My commandment is this, to love each other. Jesus remained in the presence of his disciples when he knew that they were going to abandon him. He knew that his disciples were not going to we're not going to be able to follow through on what they said they were going to do. Jesus, we want to follow you. Well, you can't. I know, Peter, you say you're going to follow me, but even you will deny me three times. He stayed. He loved them to the very end. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus... Uh, Jesus invites his three closest friends into that time. He calls them into the garden with him to pray with him. He says, would you please pray with me? He knows they're going to fall asleep. He says, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And yet he still calls them in. He still invites them in. I wonder if, if in moments when we felt like Someone's hurt us. Even, even here, even here in the church. If, someone, if we felt like someone's hurt us, if we still stayed, if we still remained together, we experienced Jesus in our midst together. It could be very easy to say, well, there's a lot of churches in town. Um, I, could, I could just go to another church. But what would it look like to, if, if we felt like a wrong was done against us, that we stayed in Jesus' presence here and worked that out? We loved each other in the midst of pain. And, and I, I have to say, um, TAC, I think you do that well. Staying. I think your presence here is a testimony to what God is doing in you and what God is doing through you and what God is doing among you as a body, right, as a family. And that's not easy. I know that's not, that's not always easy. But when Jesus is at work and we're willing to stay and still be connected to Jesus through one another, that we experience him in a powerful way. One other thing that we see Jesus experiencing in this time is anxiety. And I want to look at the garden for a moment. Um, anxiety is just an emotional response to a future situation. It's an emotional response. Uh, so I know sometimes we, um, we give, uh, we, we get very serious about anxiety. We think of anxiety as a very bad thing, but it's also very natural. There's a natural part to it. When we um, experience something that we, we think about a future event, and we experience stress or anxiety about that. I'll just look at Mark. This is Mark 14. Uh, 
verse 32, if, you wanna, if you'd like to follow along. So they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Jesus was deeply distressed and troubled about what was about to happen. He knew, he knew what was coming. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That is an intense experience of anxiety and stress. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. We know in another account that Jesus even sweat blood, right? Drops of blood fell from his brow because he was so distressed over what was about to happen. But what did Jesus do? What did abiding in the Father look like for Jesus in this moment? He went to prayer. He went to prayer. He went to a quiet place, and he got on his knees he said, Lord, this is everything that I'm going through. This is how I feel. Um, he doesn't leave it there, right? He speaks truth in the midst of that season. He shares what's on his heart, but then he also speaks truth. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but what you will. Lastly, Jesus experienced his physical limits. Um, that night, it seems fairly clear that Jesus didn't sleep that night. <clears throat> he prayed all night, and then Judas showed up with the gang of people who were going to arrest him. And I don't know about you, um, but a sleepless night, literally no sleep is, I'm not feeling too great the next day, right? I did an all-nighter a couple times in college. Uh, <laughs> Touche. <laughs> and I, yeah, I feel like it takes a week to recover. Um, I hear college students talk about the all-nighters that they pull, and they don't look too hot the next day. You, say, you look kind of sick, like maybe you should go lay down somewhere. Um, now, I have children, so you know how that goes. <clears throat> On the bad nights when Amy and I have gotten two to four hours of sleep, I just think, I'm going to go insane. There's no way that I can get up and walk through this day. But Jesus has spent all night in the presence of the Father, right? He spent all night in the presence of the Father. But that's just the beginning. He spends a good portion of that night and the morning being questioned over and over and over again, being taunted, his character questioned, and integrity total exhaustion, moving from the religious leaders to Pilate and back again and back again, beaten, whipped, beyond what we could possibly imagine here. Um, those nights where I couldn't, didn't sleep by choice in college, even carrying my backpack across campus felt like a burden. Imagine carrying a cross. His physical limits. What did he do? As he hangs on the cross, he quotes scripture. He quotes scripture. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the first line of Psalm 22. And I want to read to you, this is the way that they used to memorize scripture in, in that that um, 
time. They would memorize the first line, and the first line was kind of like their cue to the rest of the psalm. So most, most of the people who were there probably heard him cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And probably thought to themselves the rest of the psalm, or at least those who had gotten to study that far. I would imagine that Jesus was sifting through the entire Psalm 22, as maybe he didn't say it all, but I'm, I imagine it was probably going through his brain if he's speaking out the first line. Here's the first five verses of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. When we reach our physical limits, if you have ever experienced pain, maybe you live with chronic pain. Maybe that's a part of your life. Jesus shows us and invites us to abide with him by sitting with scripture, being with him, committing scripture to memory. Um, that's, that's kind of a lost art in a lot of ways. We don't, I tell you, I don't, feel like I need to memorize anything. I can write it down and I've got it in my pocket. I've got 16 different versions on my phone. Like, why would I need to memorize something? Um, I think in this kind of situation, we don't really have our phone to, to lean back on, right? If we're in a situation where things have been stripped from us and, and we've been pushed to our limit, what's going to come to mind is what's in our heart, what's established here. He also quotes Psalm 31, 5. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This has been termed a model of prayer for everyone when afraid, sick, or facing one's own death. It says, in effect, I commit myself to you, O God, in my living and in my dying in the good times and in the bad, whatever I am and have, I place in your hands, O oh God, for your safekeeping. At the end of all of this, in the same discourse, Jesus has a lot for us to sit with, to marinate, to hold. And I want us to think about some of these things that Jesus invites us to soak in certainly his presence and his words. This is what he says. I will send you a comforter, an advocate who will be with you forever, the spirit of truth. No matter what kind of physical pain we might experience, no matter what kind of anxieties we might have, no matter what kind of broken relationships we might experience, Jesus invites us and promises that he will send a comforter. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Jesus loves you more deeply than you could possibly imagine. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give, you, give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Jesus says, I'm leaving you with my peace. When you marinate and you sit with and when you spend time with Jesus, peace begins to look uh, and shine from your life. You won't experience things the same way because Jesus is now rubbing off on you. You begin to look and and sound and 
and uh, be heard kind of like Jesus. Peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Um, About a little over a month ago, uh, some of you know Amy and I have been uh, just going through a lot um, at at Simpson. Amy lost her job. Um, I was reassigned, I guess is the best way to say that. Um, Someone else was put into my role at Simpson, and now they kind of offered me a different position. It was very difficult, and, and I can't um, begin to be thankful for the ways that God has, has been present in our lives and pursued us um, and made, honestly, um, abiding with him easier than I would do on my own. God has been incredibly gracious. We got to go camping about three weeks ago with some dear friends. And we had planned this for a long time, and it just so happened that it was two weeks after we had gotten the news that things were going to be changing for us. And I'm really grateful that, that uh, I was, in some ways, um, community had already been set up for me, that we were going to have this really concentrated, um, just great time with people that we love a lot. Um, <clears throat> While we were there, we were camping. We were camping out in Brookings. Has anybody ever been to Brookings? It's like beautifully cold in the summer. It was, it was really great. In fact, when we went, it was a little too cold. The first two nights, it rained. Everything was soaking wet. It was the second night. Um, we were sleeping in a new place. So we have, we have a large tent. We have three kids. We have um, Our oldest is... Well, we'll be six. Um, our middle child is three, Naya, and our youngest is one. So our, our three-year-old is in this really um, precious time. <laughs> po- potty training is a part of that. And now we're in the woods, right? So uh, the woods isn't the friendliest place for, for potty training. Okay, so the bathroom is probably 100 feet from our tent, maybe 200 feet. Um, There's no lights. There's no um, sense of memory of where the bathroom is. I can't just tell my daughter, like, go to the bathroom. I definitely would have to walk with her. So we go to bed on the second night. It starts to rain. It sounds kind of nice, but to a three-year-old, I would imagine that's a foreign sound. That sounds kind of scary. All of a sudden, she has to go to the bathroom. (laughs) Great. What do we do? Oh, man. I shouldn't let her just go pee anywhere. I should really walk with her to the bathroom. Okay, we're going to do this. So I'm, like, getting pumped up. I'm like, okay. And I was like, Daddy, I have to go to the bathroom. I'm like, okay. um, All right. We're going to do this. Okay, stand up. We're going to, let me, let me put my shoes on. I'm going to carry you. It's raining. It's okay. I unzip the tent, and I set her down to stand up as I'm kind of shuffling to put my shoes on and get my jacket on. It is uh, dark outside. It is wet. She can hear the sound of the rain falling down. And all she can see is what's in front of her, which is, darkness and scary things that I don't recognize. And so she begins to cry. She says, Daddy, Daddy, it's dark. It's dark, I'm scared. And I said, "Um, Naya, turn around. Don't look at the darkness, just look at me. And I feel like the Lord spoke to me in that moment. Things were dark. I felt confused and disoriented. And Jesus' invitation to us in those moments is, don't look at the darkness. Just look at me. I'm going to pray for us, and then 
we're going to uh, take part in communion. Sean, would you um, come up as we pray? <clears throat> um, Lord, I, I don't know what you want to say this morning to each, each of us, Lord, but I do know that you invite us to sit and rest, remain, and hang out with you. You invite us to be in intimate and close relationship with you. Lord, I pray that whatever it is that we might walk through, relational betrayal or pain or brokenness, anxiety about the things around us in the future or whatever that might be, Lord. The, <clears throat> the phys physical limits, physical pain. God, I pray that we would look to you. That we would go to prayer. That we would sit with each other. That we would love each other. That we would Sit in your word and soak in your word. God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to turn our hearts to you in every moment. In Jesus' name, amen.